Good morning and welcome to Thursday morning Zoom. Just a reminder, we will not be doing Zoom this evening. And next week on Thursday, you guys will be out for Thanksgiving. So you'll be out Thursday and Friday of next week. Yay! It's a nice little, it's a nice little treat. And it won't be long before we're out for two weeks at Christmas. So we'll have two weeks off for Christmas. We'll come back after the new year. And um, I'm Sorry, guys, my cat wants to come join class and we're just not going to let her do that. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, our module ends tomorrow. Progress. Sorry. <laughs> let go. Um, our module ends tomorrow and I'm going to keep it open until Sunday. So I've tried to go through. Hi, beautiful Antoinette. Hello. Hello. So I'm going to uh, try to go through and open up anything that you guys haven't been assignment wise. If there's something that you would like for me to reopen and it's not opened, please shoot me a text message and I'll get in and do that in an effort to help you guys get your grades where they need to be. So um, I'm thinking of anything else. I think that that's all. I know that everybody's looking forward to the Thanksgiving break. I do want to warn you that when we have a little break from school, sometimes we have trouble getting back into the swing of it. Don't make me chase y'all. <laughs> Don't make me chase y'all. So anyway, so we're going to do our little Google slideshow. And I don't know did, who got a chance to watch the EOB or some of you are with me with when we did the EOB stuff on Tuesday. You're going to see why we did the EOB stuff on Tuesday, even though you're probably thinking, why is this lady showing us EOBs? Well, it's important when it comes to billing and payments. So we're going to, uh, it's not going to be long, but information, and we're going to go through quickly, okay? So everybody can get on with their day. So let me share my screen. So we're doing chapter 18, the last chapter we'll be doing in this module, and we're going to be talking about the billing cycle. So when you think about the billing cycle, there's, it's a whole cycle, it's the whole circle. So let's talk about what steps we take in that. We have the patient check-in, the insurance eligibility and verification, then we're going to do our coding, then our charge entry, which is our billing. And then after we get our billing in, we're going to submit our claims to the third party payer, and then we're going to begin our payment posting. So that is our billing cycle in its entirety. So the very first step in that billing cycle is when uh, the patient, you know, our encounter starts whenever the patient makes that phone call and makes an appointment. When they come in, you're going to collect the patient information when they call to schedule appointment. And then also you're gonna take information. Okay, I'm skipping ahead to step two. Let's just do step one. So when the patient calls, you're gonna collect information from them and schedule an appointment. That's when your patient encounter begins. And that's whenever that first impression comes in and so important. I'm gonna, oh goodness. I'm gonna stop the share for a second because I wanna talk to you about something. This morning, I called to make an appointment for my son to go see his doctor next week. The receptionist who took my appointment called me babe five times. What do we think about that? It's unprofessional. Very. I know we're in the swap of the South and we're honey, sweetheart, darling, sugar, darling, dumpling, whatever. But when we're, when we're at work, we have to put that aside. I don't want to be called babe by a receptionist. I almost said, darling, <laughs> let me tell you something, but I didn't. I just said, I understood the meaning. She was trying to be sweet. She was very sweet, but that's crossing that line. So remember that first impression, and I have a history with this doctor's office. So of course, I'm not going to do anything different. But if it would have been my very first impression of this facility, I may have thought very carefully about what I was doing. So no baby honey darlings when you're answering the phone. We need to be professional. We can be kind and be professional, right? 
so kind and professional. All right. So I had to tell y'all about that. I said this morning, I was like, oh, this is a perfect story. <clears throat> okay. So the second thing that happens is they're coming in for their appointment. You need to make a copy or a scan of both sides of the insurance card and also a government issued picture ID. You're going to verify the patient's eligibility, eligibility, sorry, confirming the patient's contract with the insurance company and review the patient's benefits and exclusions for certain procedures and services. Usually you're not going to do that uh, when they're coming in just for a general visit because you're not going to be doing any procedures. Okay, after the medical services have been proved, provided, you're gonna code the diagnoses and the procedures and amend any modifiers. You're gonna complete the CMS 1500 claim form and you're gonna submit that electronically unless your uh, facility has a different contract with the insurances. You're gonna review your electronic claims and, you're, and you have to make sure that you're meeting the timely filing requirements, which is not gonna be an issue if you're billing uh, every day. You might not, might not be billing for the uh, super bills that day. It might be the day before or the day before that. A lot of places bill uh, for the day before. So for example, if you got bills, super bills today to bill, it would be from yesterday. So that's step number three. Step number four, you're going to do your charge entry, which is your actual billing. And then you're going to submit your claims. The next step is going to be payment posting. Y'all, I'm so sorry. I'm so shaky from uh, not feeling real great. So y'all just bear with me. I apologize. So you're going to post payments in the patient's account using the what? The EOB. So I wasn't showing you all of that for no reason. <laughs> so you're gonna get lots of information off that EOB. Uh, you can also get something called Medicare RA, which is a remittance advice, which looks close to an EOB. It just has a lot of patients on one paper. And if you're a payment poster, this is kind of the uh, steps you're gonna take, but that will be on the job training. So what type of info is found in the patient's billing record? Well, when the first appointment is made, it's routine to ask the patient for all pertinent insurance information. Much of this information is collected on the patient intake form. And you need to always make sure that you have a medical release of information form signed in the patient's file. So you guys remember, we've talked about pre-certs and pre-offs a lot. I'm just doing a little review. The pre-certification is the process of providing, proving to the insurance company that the, med that the service is medically necessary. You're going to call the provider, give the uh, patient's uh, information to the provider, and document the outcome of the call in the patient's health record. And they're going to tell you whether it's authorized or not. Um, it does not always guarantee the payment of services. It's just proving medical necess necessity. See, I can't talk real well today. I'm sorry. So let's talk about electronic claim submission. It can be submitted in several ways, direct billing, and that's when they're going to get a paper copy, or it can be electronically carried. But we've talked about how this is the way we used to do it. We would send it to a clearinghouse. And the uh, clearinghouse acts as an intermedi intermediary between the healthcare facility and the insurance company. So, for example, if I build something out, but we left out the insurance information, the clearinghouse would catch that before it went to the third party payer and send it back to us and say, hey, put in insurance information. So it just kind of, to me, it's kind of like a sifter. It sifts out anything uh, that could be bad on the claim. Does it miss stuff? It absolutely does, but it really is good for uh, just catching those big mistakes. Okay. So we actually have practice on reading the EOB, but let's just talk a little bit more about it. The administrative medical assistant needs to understand all the elements of the EOB. Now we've been over the important elements. You need to verify that the EOB is applied to the correct patient. How do you verify a patient? It's going to be date of birth, 
And if you have more than one patient with that date of birth, you can go by address, you could keep on going, you could go by phone number, you could go by the last four of the social security number, things like that. We've talked about that before too. This is just a little review. You need to confirm that the EOB shows the same figures as that was submitted on the CMS 1500 form and post the payment and adjusted per line item. If you're going to be a post payment poster, you will be trained in this extensively. So this is just general information. Once the patient's result, I'm sorry. Once the patient's responsibility has been determined, check the patient's health record to see if a secondary insurance is listed. So if you sent to primary and there is still a balance, and the patient has a secondary, then you're gonna send it on to the secondary. You're gonna review the remarks codes on the EOB and all remarks codes on pending denied claims should be followed up immediately upon receipt of the EOB. And those are gonna be dirty claims. You want all clean claims get paid completely and then you have denied claims, which you're gonna to have to work. And we all have those. So this is talking again about rejected claims. All rejected claims have a reason code. Rejected claims should be corrected and resubmitted for payment electronically. And you need to do this ASAP. So I pulled the EOB again. And what I want to point out is we wanna look at the reason right here. You see reason 45, reason three and reason 45 again. Here is the key to those reasons. So why does this patient need to pay 95 cents? Or why is it adjusted 95 cents? Reason 45, charges exceed your contracted legislated fee arrangements. And then three, this $20, this is their co-payment, which is their responsibility. And then you have another 45 again. And then here, the group CO is contractual obligation. PR is patient responsibility. And then you have another CO. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, I know you can't read this, but I wanted to show you what a remittance advice looks like. Now, this is just the reasons. I couldn't find one that was legible and that would show us this, these, uh, these front pages. But all of these, you see each individual little line, those are patients. And either they're gonna be paid in full or they're going to be denied for one of these reasons. So you have two pages of your remittance and then the denial reasons. And this would be if you work denials. Again, if you're hired to work denials, you will be extensively trained. <clears throat> this to me is lots of digging and exploring and doing research. And so I, I liked Medicare the best. I worked Medicare the whole time that I coded uh, because to me it was the easiest to, it, it was the best laid out in my opinion. Although it doesn't look as pretty as the other one, does it? So there's two main, main reasons for denial of a payment, technical errors and insurance policy coverage issues. So again, this is just going to be a review of fraud and abuse. We have to think of the word abuse, not in the way that we're used to thinking of it, we have to think of it in an administrative way, not if someone's you know, abusing their child or abusing their spouse. So fraud is the knowing and willy, willfully executing or attempting to execute a scheme to defraud any healthcare benefit program or to obtain by means of false or fraudulent pretenses. So fraud is knowingly and willfully Abuse is an unintended action 
that directly or indirectly results in an overpayment to a healthcare provider. I know it doesn't sit well with our sensibilities to think of abuse being unintentional, but this is just in that administration por portion of things. So let's talk about when you have to discuss a payment issue with a patient. And we've discussed this a little bit before, but money is always a difficult and sensitive subject. So we need to make sure that we understand that even if the patient gets upset, they're not upset at us. They're upset because they may have to pay money that they can't afford. It's usually going to fall to the person who does. It says medical assistant, but if you have a patient responsibility on like a remittance advice, you're going to have to let the patient know of, know that if you're that if you're in that specific job. Show patience and patient, be patient and show sensitivity and uh, don't harass the patient, patient and they should be offered a variety of payment methods. A lot of places will give a, a payment plan. So just have the information before you call for that reason. Okay, so here's your assignment. The scenario is Christy Brown is meeting with you regarding the bill she received in the mail. She called to make an appointment and she voiced her confusion about the bill. She stated that she thought her insurance covered everything. You check her record and see that she met her deductible and now needs to pay the 20% of the bill amount. She owes $170. So all that I want you to do is I want you to script a conversation with Christy Brown, how you would explain this to her. I put up a copy of another insurance card. I know you guys are maybe getting sick of seeing insurance cards by now, but I just wanted to point out that there is great information on an insurance card. You can see what the copay is, what your specialist copay is, the emergency room, uh, and the drug copays. 